Welcome everybody out there here to our next uh, webinar at uh, JFT Bank and the warm welcome in the name of JFT Bank as well. My name Stefan Fredrichowski as always for let's say those kind of uh, webinars. Uh, today yeah we have the 17th of October 2019 and it's really a pleasure for me to have you all here to the webinar about human meets artificial intelligence who is a better trader. Okay, that kind of title has already two aspects. One is in general talking about artificial intelligence and then transfer that to trading and finally to the question, hmm, who is a better trader? The machine, the computer or the trader, the human trader? Let's see. In general, today's uh, talk is um, more an introduction to artificial intelligence at all. So more in general, because I think on the one hand, artificial intelligence is just a buzzword uh, during the last couple of months or even years. And I think it's a good idea to know a little bit more about that, at least how artificial intelligence works, how it is trained and teached and finally we will do the transform to trading as well but honestly that's just a minor part but on the other hand <laughs> trading and um, artificial intelligence is quite a good combination because uh, things which might be not that obvious in general in artificial intelligence become much more obvious um, when we talk about trading. Later we will have something like a cost function or a profit function that is normally meant in general. For trading, the translation is quite obvious. If I talk about profit function, I think anybody would know what I'm talking about. Even that can be a little bit more complicated, but anyhow, so profit function just as one keyword is really obvious when it comes to trading. Um, you might realize that you can already download the slides of today's talk here uh, via your go to webinar control panel. And further, if you have any questions or just want to get in touch with me, drop me a line at s.friedrichowski at jfdbank.com as seen here on my first slide. You know, whenever I have a webinar, I always have to show at least once the so-called risk disclaimer because we talk about trading, we talk about investment, we talk about trading strategies, but finally, when it comes to your decisions, of course, you do everything on your own responsibility. Okay, I think that's quite self-explaining, but it has to be at least mentioned once, once during any webinar. Let me guide you a little bit through the topics of today's talk. And honestly, I uh, have had the same talk, and not identical, but um, more or less the same talk, just two weeks ago on an international conference um, at so-called uh, IFTA, which stands for International Federation of Trading and uh, trading analysis, something like that. Oh, sorry, I missed maybe uh, the right uh, translation of uh, the shortcut. But <clears throat> that is an international federation. All technical analysts are joined together in that uh, organization. And they have once a year um, one uh, central meeting and uh, this time that has been in Egypt, uh, better to say in Cairo, and uh, I did the same talk uh, there. Uh, but um, yeah, in this case there have been about 200 participants joining um, that kind of talk. So for me it's um, more or less a replication of that and I even don't have to translate the slides uh, as uh, normally because normally I do the webinar first in um, German uh, one day before and then translate the slides. Uh, in this case it was vice versa because uh, the original slides of course have been in English. But back to the topic. So talking about artificial intelligence I need to show a short overview and I will introduce you into that of course and then we have to compare the general aspects of human behavior and 
let's call it machine behavior, uh, so that we have at least a first hint uh, who might be better finally when it comes to trading. You know, if you join my webinars, that I have a um, more or less completely different point of view when it comes to trading. It's more a mathematical point of view. So I'm not uh, that much related to charts. Now, for me, I have time series data that is the input or any other uh, data. So everything is data driven. And uh, that's quite good because uh, when we talk about artificial intelligence, uh, that's exactly um, the starting point for uh, any any neural network. We will introduce that, of course, as well. And uh, so we, we need a different perspective uh, when it comes to trading. And I mentioned already the, the final buzzword around artificial intelligence are so-called neural networks. So that's an adaptation of the human brain and I will introduce those neural networks and how they work and how they learn because that's even the more important part um, because we want to teach them. We, we want really to get to the point that we do not put that much um, information ad hoc into the, the system, into the machine. So we don't want to, to have already an idea of a trading strategy. No, um, here the point is that we will want to teach the network and the best would be if the network is teaching itself. So if it doesn't need any human um, impact or influence or a hint, and that's what's really possible with neural networks, that they really learn by themselves. Finally, I will show and share with you some results of my own uh, neural network trading activities. Still, it's not um, a live uh, account, what I normally do when I talk about trading. It's always good to show really live trading results. In this case, um, it's not a live trading account, but at least that you get a glimpse of yeah what's possible. And uh, still, it's not the holy grail, uh, of course not. But uh, let me go into that topic later. Okay, um, this slide um, has been for Cairo just uh, to talk a little bit about JFD. Uh, what we don't have to do here, because I assume you know everything around and about JFD, uh, what you can trade, that you can trade stocks even commission-free and cryptos can be traded as well, um, those um, commission-free as well, the CFDs on cryptos. But anyhow, we don't need that. Let me, let me give you a short overview about artificial intelligence at all. Because that is something which did not start during the last couple of years. Okay, it has been in the news, um, but uh, people are uh, in that topic um, already more than 70 years, um, starting about 1950. So those numbers, uh, honestly, um, I took those from the literature. Um, I have not really try to confirm them, but anyhow, that's what I found there. So starting already in 1950, artificial intelligence, okay. But now the question is how to define it. I mean, artificial, how to define artificial intelligence, um, or let's start with how to define intelligence at all. That's really a tricky part because um, it's not really quite easy to, to, to give a clear definition of intelligence. Uh, you might have something in your mind um, that's good, uh, but something like a measurement, uh, like, like uh, um, measure, the measurement of any distance or time difference or whatever, that's much more easy than to measure intelligence. Okay, there are contests about that and then you get a number of 100, whatever, um, but that's really a complicated stuff. But the definition of artificial intelligence is quite easy. Any technique which enables a computer to mimic human behavior. Okay, maybe <clears throat> you would have not thought that it's that easy. Uh, so do I. Um, but it means that any tools which help human by 
mimic human behavior are already called artificial intelligence. So that means even a machine which which um, is transporting something from A to B uh, could be something which is called artificial intelligence. Okay, you would not maybe join the same opinion, so do I, but anyhow, something which mimic human behavior is already to some extent artificial intelligence. Okay, talking about IQ, it would mean maybe a five or a 10. Uh, the average human, I think, has a 100 level. But anyhow, so it's really low level stuff, but it's already helping um, this human. So that's good. So let's take that as a starting point. Since 1980, we talk already about machine learning. And that is a subset which uses statistical methods to enable machines to improve with experience. Hey, that's quite a cool clue. There are two very important aspects in that sentence. The one is to improve with experience. And that's really good because that's a little bit already the adaptation of, of the human mankind it, or the human, human um, development. Think about you um, as a child. Um, so you got more and more experience. Things have been explained to you, maybe by your parents or whatever. Um, they, they have they put their fingers on a tree and say, hey, this is a tree, this is a cat, and so on. So you, you get information and you improve by experience. Maybe first you can't distinguish between a table and a chair, but with more experience, you can distinguish between those two furnitures. That's the one thing, improve with experience as a key element of machine learning. The other thing is, and that's quite good because we are trader and um, those who look more from a mathematical point of view, the, you know statistical methods we, we use in, able, uh, in, in order to derive trading strategies statistical methods that means we don't think in black and white we think more in probabilities um, okay if we get a new picture with some unclear information we would finally may say okay there might be a cat on that picture so we use statistical methods and that's exactly the same what we do when it comes to trading um, that we don't think about the next trade is definitely with 100% a winner trade. It will never be. But we think in probabilities. And those statistical methods can help to learn. And think about your childhood. You have done the same. You did mistakes. And okay, your parents told you that is wrong and that is right. And therefore, you 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 train your own statistics and your own um, experience. So that is a key element of machine learning, learning already starting in 1980. Since only almost 10 years, we talk about deep learning. And now it comes directly to neural networks. They have not been invented um, just 10 years ago. They are much older. But from that point in time, it's really possible um, to, to make computation of uh, multi-layer neural networks and to, to really train a neural network with data because we later we'll see we may, may have uh, thousands or even millions of, of nodes and weights um, and neurons. So we, we adapt the human brain and try to teach that neural network in a similar way than we have been teached or still are teached by our, um, by our own, by reading, by, by getting feedback. And that is called deep learning. And we will introduce that as well. Okay. Let me start first with some success stories about artificial intelligence at all, because that makes a little bit more clear what we are really talking about here. So one example are 
that's really, uh, almost the oldest application of uh, artificial intelligence, AI, are uh, email spam filters. That's good because um, your, your email provider knows any email before you get them. So your email provider can already uh, get additional information how often it is the same email sent around uh, that might be already a hint that uh, it might be spam or it has it contains special keywords and that is a self-learning process but in most cases educated supervised um, so there are still humans involved give some hints and more and more those um, artificial intelligence neural networks learn even by their own. It's a little bit more obvious when it comes to artificial intelligence when we talk about games, computer games, for example, or any game uh, you might play by your own as well. Starting already ten, um, more than 20 years ago, there was already a chess computer called Deep Blue, and that computer won against the world champion uh, Kasparov. That Deep Blue was more algorithmic um, driven and not already a, a deep learning algorithm, but it has already the capabilities to be better than the world champion. Wow. And that's now 22 years ago. Just two years ago, there was another breakthrough um, with uh, the computer program AlphaGo from Google, and that played the game Go, which is even more complicated than chess because of the uh, possible uh, situations. And um, the computer program won against Ki G, who has been the world champion of um, the game Go. The other good thing about AlphaGo, that computer program or algorithm, that was a neural network and that was teached by itself. How is that going? Let me explain to you a little bit. Think about you have two computers and you just introduce or you code into the computer the rules of the game. And then you let the two computers play against each other. And now it comes to a profit function. You finally say what is good, good is winning. And after they played one game, they can analyze and realize what has been good, what has been wrong. So they can improve themselves, which is good, because that is another key aspect of any deep learning network. The other good thing is they can do that playing against each other extremely fast. So it took not very long that the algorithm was already better than um, that uh, best uh, Go player, Kiji. The same algorithm was applied to chess once again. And there I can tell you a really an astonishing number. So we start just with the rules of the game of chess, um, code that into the computer, and then let the two machines play against each other. And after only four hours, that computer could not be, um, uh, was already better than any human in four hours. You may know about chess and you know that's a really complicated game. So that algorithm, that neural network was able to learn it in four hours better than any human. Wow. That is a success story. And two years later this year, uh, the computer um, take over the game poker, which is once again even more complicated. And it's uh, more complicated because of what is called uncomplete information. You know, by, uh, at poker, you don't have any uh, um, information available because um, people have their cards in their hand. Um, that's completely different to chess or um, go because there any information is available but that, even that game is now taken over by computer well 
We have other sources about our success stories about artificial intelligence. You might um, like them or not, but the product placement by Amazon, Facebook, Google, and co. Uh, is completely guided by artificial intelligence. <clears throat> and I have uh, to admit that they're really doing a good job, at least if I look to my uh, personal advertisement after buying something. Um, yeah, the recommendations are not that bad. Or <clears throat> you um, hear about self-driving cars, that those might be even close to market introduction. And you see, I made some question marks behind that because there are some buts, uh, I think, about that. And I will tell you um, in a minute. In general, a little bit beside self-driving cars, all the other examples are highly specialized tasks. So that is something which is quite common for all those kind of applications. And it might even be one of our conclusions today that um, the computers and uh, artificial intelligence is perfect, but maybe still now only for highly specialized tasks. That might be. Um, general aspects maybe cannot be taken over that fast. Let's see. Let's compare first human and machine in general. And let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages. Of course, when it comes to the machine, speed yeah, is outstanding, precision outstanding. The machine is emotionless, which is really a good um, skill. Um, OK, my one more might not name it a skill for a machine, but in comparison to the human, it's definitely an advantage. And the machine is at least in principle 24 seven capable. Um, if there's power and maybe if there's internet, if you need at least the internet as uh, one additional source. The human, yeah, we have to sleep. Um, okay, that's good advantages for the machine. Let's think about the human more in general. We have very good advantages. One I would call intuition. That is, um, let's call it a skill or a feature, yeah, which is more like an, um, in English we say educated guess. And that's a very good phrase. So we just don't guess no we use all our our information in our brain in order to to judge the now new situation that is something which is outstanding for a human or just as another aspect of a human our creativity is once again outstanding think about uh, art and and uh, maybe pictures of of um, you have seen if you understand them, they are really creative. And there are other examples like music, uh, composers, whatever, you name it. Creativity is a big advantage of a human. We can create new things just from scratch, even in a few seconds. And they might even be really good. A disadvantage of the machine is, at least up to now, there's still human input necessary. If that is not anymore the case, and we are on the edge of that, that a computer is coding a computer. So it's developing its own code. That is more an evolutional step. And that is quite interesting aspect if we come to that stage, because then we can adapt the the nature at all you know that even the human is just a product of evolution but the computer might do it much faster we are not there um but maybe quite close disadvantages of human of course um psychology mistakes we do and we are quite small mistakes think about trading um even I have done the trades uh, totally wrong, just by pressing the wrong numbers. I want to buy a 0.01 uh, lot trade. Uh, it was US dollar, Japanese yen, and I bought 
one lot instead and then i was a little bit surprised how uh, money goes up and down whoops uh, i closed the trade um, fortunately in profit but yeah mistakes happen in general it looks like a clear advantage for the machine but we have to talk about the buts as well and I, let me mention already one you I have realized in my last slides that on, for self-driving cars, I made some question marks behind. The good thing is that around self-driving cars, there's uh, an open source community as well, not only uh, the car manufacturer, uh, at least a few of them, they really release data for, for open source and so that other people can try to investigate those data. And um, there has been one university, one team uh, doing that, and they realized that if you change in some certain situations, just a few pixels, and the number was six, within the input and those are camera pictures uh, as one in, uh, input of, of self-driving cars if you just change six pixels the car would have made an accident and that makes some really big question marks uh, behind self-driving cars noise in general is still something which is uh, let's call it poison to any artificial network uh, you can have even an artificial network uh, you can talk to uh, in order to make uh, appointments uh, or reservations for a restaurant but if behind you put some noise then the machine might not understand you but not because like like humans because uh, the noise is too loud no just because the the um, that there is that kind of noise that might disturb um, any any um, new network at all. There are more buts, but let's dive into trading and into the machines. But let's start trading really from a mathematical point of view. And for me personally, trading in a nutshell is just one equation. Okay, there's a formula, there's a function with some input parameters and Finally, the decision is long, short, flat. Let's keep it that simple. Um, there might be different underlyings uh, simultaneously or just one underlying as output. Let's think about uh, Euro, US dollar, long, short, flat. That's all. So there's a function with some input and there's an output, long, short, flat. The input might be, of course, the time. Of course, the price history how long i don't care at least not um, within that um, formalism there might be key figures uh, i don't really like it to name them key figures like indicators because uh, key figures in general are just um, calculation out of the price history so it's not really a new information there might be other inputs for that equation news fundamental data we need to know about trading costs, spreads, commission, for example. Of course, we need some um, money management, like do I have already open positions, uh, how much money I have left in my account, and those kind of informations. During the last two years, uh, I, I tend to add at least uh, Donald Trump's Twitter account as a news input. Uh, input uh, feed as well because even that might have um, an impact on any trading decision so overall we have a huge amount of data input and then we do decisions long short flat that is trading in a nutshell what it means it means that finally we have to make decisions in each millisecond Okay, that's like you sit in front of your computer and you want to trade. The human does not trend, tend to really do decisions in milliseconds. And of course, we are not really capable to do that. Uh, we might might use uh, things like uh, buy stop orders, limit orders, uh, stop losses, take profit levels and something like that. But that is just a conditional equation 
uh, in the same kind I, I introduced here already. Um, and the condition is just the price. If the price hits a certain level, okay, then that is the trigger. So, so it's not really something new. But what we try to do, we have a so-called profit function, something we want to achieve. Uh, playing chess is to win the game. As a trader, okay, we want to generate profits. That's um, quite obvious. And when we look to trading, we can think about, let's say, four different trading approaches. And honestly, um, the list might not be complete and um, the borderline between those might not be that sharp. So there's a smooth transition maybe from each to the next one. Let's start on the left upper side, just just a chart. And what we do is we analyze the chart with technical analysis, um, market analysis, whatever. We draw some lines, we draw some indicators, uh, some levels, Fibonacci levels, you name it. Out of that kind of analysis, that chart analysis, we derive our decisions about trading. Okay, that's one, the maybe oldest um, approach of trading. But there might be another one. Let's go jump to the right. I call that rule-based. So we set up some certain rules, like um, we might have done some investigations, some statistical investigations, and we realized that on Friday, it's a good day to trade gold long. We even might not ask why. We have just that statistical observation. And if that turns out to be good, why not? So we have an edge, we have a probability advantage, and that is a rule-based trading. You might have lots and other rules as well, but that is what I just call rule-based trading. Then we have one, another kind of, of a trading approach, which is based on algorithms, some, some conditions which have to be reached. Uh, so it's a little bit more complex way of rule based but we train um, or we, we code finally an expert advisor and uh, that kind of algorithm is then translated into traits and the machine is doing the complete job and last but not least we have those deep neural networks with lots of nodes and connections links between those nodes and that is a topic we will now go into to have that as in general, as artificial intelligence and for trading as well. Neural networks is just the adaptation of the human brain. And I've, I'm uh, not a biologist, but um, you, you may even know more about uh, uh, the real um, behavior of the brain than I do. But what we have is we have neurons and those neurons are linked, connected, to other neurons. And then we have signals like, like electrical signals connecting one neuron to the other. And that is in total our human brain. Our human brain has about 100 billions, and you see what I really mean because it's always complicated to talk about millions and billions. So it's a one with 11 zeros. That's the number of neurons we have in our brain. And if you compare that to a computer, it's a little bit tricky to say, hmm, is a new one like a CPU or like, like a data storage, one byte or some, or better to say one bit. That's a little bit a combination of both. So therefore, the number, if it would be CPUs, it would be really outstanding. If it's just the, the memory, hmm, okay, um, lots of computer have same amount or even more. But it's really the combination that neurons are um, memory and CPUs as well. Everything is now connected. And of course, we have an input world. So sensors like, like our skin, like eyes, our eyes, our ears, uh, whatever. And we have outputs <clears throat> that is 
talking, doing actions, pressing the button and buy one lot euro US dollar, um, driving cars, walking around, whatever. That is our output. And the other thing about the human brain in general is, okay, um, it's teachable. So it can learn. It, from one second to the next, it's never ever once again identical to a state before. So it, it goes around as we speak and we can learn. Hopefully you learn during this talk as well. That's a good thing about the human brain. And the general learning method is reward and punish. Okay, that's maybe a little bit brutal. It's maybe a little bit brutal, but that's exactly how it works. And um, think about your childhood. You have done things right, things wrong, and maybe you got something when you did it right. And okay, punish doesn't mean really punish, but maybe your mother was not that good with you anymore. Something like that. But that is a general learning methodology of the human brain. The older we, we got, uh, the more complex it, it will be, and we can even feedback ourselves. With, um, so we have some additional uh, methods as well. Just for a comparison, a bee has just 900,000 units, and still that brain can do things the human can't do. They can fly around, and they do it quite well. Even in a storm, they can do it. So 900,000 might be already something quite good. But now, how does we, how do we transfer that into computers, into neural networks, and how they work? Yeah, the first thing is we just do the same like the human brain. So we have what's called input layer. Then we have inputs. Think about inputs might be historical price data. And just the first one here might be um, the current price, uh, the next one, the price uh, one hour ago, uh, third one, 10 hours ago, whatever. And we can have more input layers. Or it could be a camera, uh, then this would be just an input pixel, um, just as an example. Then we have additional neurons, and you can see they are always connected. That one is connected to all input uh, neurons, and so on and so forth. And we might have more so-called hidden layers. And finally, we have that output layer. And if you think about my trading equation, that might be long, short, flat, one, zero, minus one just as an example. So that's how we set up our network with layers. And those layers, uh, we, we might have thousands of nodes within one layer, and we might even have thousand layers. So we might end up with millions of nodes, similar to the human brain. And that's exactly the way how the computer, uh, how artificial uh, neural networks uh, are created and set up in a computer exactly that way so now the part comes to a little bit more more formula way so we have inputs or just the uh, input for a given new one so this central one here on the right hand side and we have signals and those signals are just combined and that combination is Indeed, in almost any case, that's simple like this equation. So it's a weighted sum of those inputs. So we have weights for each input, and then we sum them up. And then, with that kind of combination, we go through what is called an activation function. And that might, in a, in a simplest version, just a threshold. If we exceed a threshold, we fire into the right direction. I use the same words like when it comes to human brain. 
one really calls that uh, um, that way that neurons fire. So they they let a signal through under certain conditions. Think about that kind of threshold function. So, and that thing here, that kind of combination is done in any node. That means finally that the most important <clears throat> thing within a new network are just the weights. Within those weights, that is a memory, that is a learning process. So the critical thing is to find the right weights within that complex neural network. So that is how a neural network works. So the input is then transformed from the left to the right via those kind of equations, which are really simple. And if you do it a little bit uh, smart, then you can do those things quite fast. Now we want to train neural networks. So let's talk about learning methodologies. And in general, I just mentioned, we'll mention here three, three different kinds, labeled data, unlabeled data, and reinforcement learning. Transition, once again, is not that sharp as uh, it might uh, look like. Let, let's start with labeled data. And the, the easiest part, think about you have 1,000 pictures, um, and those pictures are labeled in terms of what's seen on the picture, like on the picture is a dog, on the picture is a cat, on the picture is a chair, whatever. So that means you, you have labeled data that is called supervised learning because there's an additional input. When it comes to trading, that kind of labeling can be done by the computer itself. Because think about a chart. Within a chart, a historical chart, you can always start a virtual trade at the end of any 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 candle with a certain stop loss and a certain take profit and you will see because you can go into the future from from that point in time and you will see whether the trade would have been profitable or not stop loss or take profit so we can even label our data by our own that's good that's the way i did it for my um, example later we can even use unlabeled data, but that means finally we take the same pictures as my first line, but without the information what's seen on the picture. Such a neural network will learn to classify, to separate those, um, those pictures. Finally, it cannot name a picture dog, but it knows what a dog looks like. Only the naming, but that's the same with languages. So uh, I call a dog here dog. In German, I would call it a hund, and I have no idea in any other language, anyhow. So that doesn't really matter, at least that if you know what's really on the picture. So those kind of unlabeled data can be used as well. And finally, we use the methodology of reinforcement, and that is exactly that punish and reward, as already mentioned. If something turns out to be good, we know that. If something turns out to be bad, we know that as well. At least if we have something how we want to optimize, and that is the so-called profit function. For games, it's just winning. For trading, it's profit. Uh, for classification, it's hit rate to guess uh, to get the best hit rate um, uh, about um, recognizing pictures. So, uh, just as an example, what we try during the learning process is always to improve according to our profit function. What does it mean, or how is it done with a neural network? And I really used straight away the, the example of historical um, data uh, of trading. So we, we take as input historical data, uh, as I mentioned, maybe price, current price, first one, one hour ago, 10 hours ago, 100 hours ago, and so on and so forth. And 
the the funny thing is we really start with random weights as our connection weights between our nodes between our new ones if you start with random number okay that sounds really crazy but that's the starting situation but now what we can do is we can take our historical price data and and our complete history of maybe 10 years and push them through the network. So what we would get is finally, we would get an equity curve because we always get those decisions like long, short, flat. And that kind of process uh, for neural networks is called forward propagation because the flow is from the left to the right. And now the only question we have is, how can we change the weights in a way that we improve our equity curve. And that can be done statistically <clears throat> just by random numbers again. And that is called backward pr propagation if you do it really smart. Because we can do that step uh, with, with some uh, algorithms, which one is called decent, gra uh, gradient decent. And uh, there are some other algorithms so that we can do that quite fast. But the question here is how to change the weights so that the equity curves improves and then reiterate. Because we cannot get the, the, the optimum state uh, already in one step. But we can iterate. And that is how neural networks learn. Changing weights in a way that our profit function becomes better. That mentioned algorithm, recent, a gradient decent, uh, is quite simple. Um, even the, within the picture, everything is German, but anyhow, we have a starting point that is here. And what we do is we, we just make a small step to the side, just in order to, to get the gradient, the slope. Because if we now know the slope, we know the direction we should go. And that is just the next step in our iteration. We know that if we go downwards, if we want to find a minimum, um, then we are doing a step into the right direction. And we simply would stop when the slope reaches the zero. That's all. And that step is, cannot only be done in one dimension. Now, even in um, higher dimensional spaces, uh, you can do the same uh, kind of procedure. Um, if you look here to the graph, we start here. And then we, in order to find the minimum, what we do is we, we do one trial step in this direction, maybe in the X direction and one in the Y direction. And then we know into what direction we should do the next step. It's a little bit like um, standing um, um, on a mountain uh, somewhere uh, and looking for the valley or try to reach the valley. We, we even with blind eyes, we can do that kind of procedure by doing those trial steps to X and Y direction, and then going into that direction, which has the biggest slope south, also down, and then we reach, and now I have to mention, we reach a local minimum. That does not mean that we reach the, the global minimum, but if we use different starting points, uh, we might find at least something which is close to the global minimum. One of those big achievements since 2010 have been um, algorithms which enable us to do that for all weights within our neural network, just in one calculation step. So we don't have to do it uh, for all the different weights individual. No, we can do it in a single step. Um, and that kind of backward propagation was really one key invention uh, for, for deep learning, just in order to be quite fast.
Remember, I mentioned that we might have even millions of nodes, which means millions of weights. And um, to, to do that kind of optimization um, really needs some tricky algorithms. One other important uh, methodology for learning with neural networks um, is test data splitting. So we have data. Um, let's think about the complete um, blue circle here. And now we, we do something really quite um, um, easy stuff here. We split our data in training data and the other one are called test data or out of sample data. That means we teach and learn with our neural network with those 80% data and there are other numbers like 70 to 30 or 90 to 10. Anyhow, we, we use those data for teaching the neural network and then finally we, we do a test on our remaining test data, the so-called out-of-sample data. And only if our neural network behaves there good as well, uh, we would go further with that neural network. So that is um, something which is quite similar to what I, for trading strategies, normally do with my uh, walk forward methodology and um, you might have seen that in other webinars already that we use some history going to the future which have not been part of our optimization and then going f further step by step it's quite a similar uh, process but it's quite important because otherwise we might end up in overfitted new networks like the same uh, for overfitted training um, algorithms. Yeah, there are some other, other methodologies, uh, pruning and so on, but um, I don't go into that. Just that you see a little bit of practical examples of neural networks and training. So what I've done here, I have plotted the hit rate of the sign prediction for a next H4 candle. <coughs> and I have done that kind of, of uh, investigation for 29 different symbols here. Um, and you might think, oops, uh, that looks crazy. Uh, and especially in the history, because there's 2006, 2008, it really looks crazy, isn't it? But let me explain what is really shown here. So I just optimize or train the new network in order to answer the following question. Is the next candle, the next H4 candle of, for example, Australian dollar, Canadian dollar, a long candle or a short candle? Does it go upwards or downwards? That has been all the question. And what I plotted here is the, the difference to the 50-50. So, because just uh, tossing a coin uh, would give you just 50-50 or here it would be the zero line. And now what I did, originally I started with data from 2004, which is not shown here within the graph, because those have been my input for the new network and for the training procedure. And then I applied it stepwise for a little bit in the future and those results, those uh, the hit rate is exactly what's been plotted here. But the more and more I go to the right here, the more and more I have had more historical data to train my network. And what you can see is that my, my overall hit rate stabilizes, saturates. That means finally for any of those um, underlyings, I got a hit rate which is better than 50-50. That's good. Is that already a trading algorithm? <laughs> yes, but is it uh, directly profitable? The answer is no, because hit rate is not profit. You know, um, a hit rate of 50-50, even for a trade uh, with stop loss and um, uh, take profit uh, equal size, uh, doesn't mean that you earn money simply because you have the cost of trading spread and commission. So we need more. But that was just my starting point in order to, to get a feeling of what's really possible with new networks. 
just by training them with historical data and the profit function in this case was a hit rate itself. Going for real trades, I used labeled data with a fixed stop loss and a fixed take profit. And in this case, I just investigate or just plotted here uh, trades for Euro Japanese Yen. The variation between the different lines is just how the network looks like, how many nodes, how many hidden layers, how many input nodes, and so on. But what I achieved was really some good trading results. Just always taking the history and apply what I have learned there for the next future and then going further, further, further. So even with different kinds of new networks, I found profitable results, including costs. And the, the data input has been the historical price itself, but labeled uh, because in the history I know that for a given candle, how a trade with a fixed stop loss and a fixed take profit would end. And that is what I achieved. You may ask, hey, why do, don't you trade it already? It, now it comes back to the buts. I mentioned the self-driving cars. So I'm still not that convinced to do it already completely automatically, but I'm close to that because I have some more results uh, up to now. But that's how neural networks work and they can be applied for trading as well. That brings me already to my summary. And I started with the question, who's a better trader? Um, the machine, artificial intelligence or the human? And honestly, <clears throat> it depends on who you ask. I personally believe computers are the better trader than the human, but not only because of artificial intelligence, just because of mathematical uh, methods. So even statistical derived trading strategies are quite good and they can be executed directly with a computer. You might call it artificial intelligence as well. I would not name them that way, but um, in that aspect, definitely, I think the computer is a better trader. But we have those situations which we don't know. And I know from literature and a little bit even from my own new networks that if something new happens, then hmm, um, we don't know exactly how the, the network will react. The key advantage of the human is definitely intuition, creativity, and our unbeatable experience. So we can even solve situations we have never been in, and we can give right answers to those kind of uh, problems as well. But let me mention already the next step in computational science. And the next step is what is called causal neural networks. So they are not just data driven, they use data as input, yes, but they are more logic driven. What do I mean with that? Think about the following statement. If I say Adam is taller than Bird and Bird is taller than Christian, then the conclusion is that Adam is taller than Christian as well. That's something which is quite easy for us as a human, but it's definitely quite difficult for any neural network so far. But if those neural networks can, can derive causal relationships between things, data, input feeds, and so on, then they might become much more intelligent than they are now. In general, the breakthrough of artificial intelligence might take longer than we think today. But what I have in mind is real intelligence, not highly specialized tasks, which can be done better by the machine than any human. No, we want to have more general intelligence. So 
if I ask a chess computer, please um, uh, add up the number eight and nine, the chess computer will not answer because it's not trained for that simple task. But I want to have an artificial intelligence network. I can do, for example, any question and get right answers. And that's much, much more complex than anything we have today. Or if you ask a chess computer, oh, please take up the board uh, out of um, somewhere and build the chess game, hmm. the chess computer can't do it. If you play with a human, no problem. So there are other relationships which are important as well. And only with those, I would really call it intelligence. But maybe we are not that far from that. Computer getting smarter and smarter, faster and faster, and algorithms as well. And the same is true for trading. Hopefully, you learn a little bit during this webinar that you have trained your neural network in your brain and get some conclusions for your own as well. It was not already a complete list how to create a new network so that you can start trading with that, but that is really a task which cannot be covered in a in a um, in an hour. But at least you should have an idea of how new networks work and how they learn and how they can be teached. Hope you enjoyed the webinar. The recordings you will find tomorrow on the JFD YouTube channel, and uh, I hope to see you again for the next webinar um, and uh, have a good time. Bye-bye.